Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, today we, were going, we are going to talk about St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. Uh, this would have been a feast day of his, even in Lent. Uh, it's a third class feast. And Ferias of Lent are third class, but today is also the Ember Saturday of Lent, which is a second class. So he gets um, this year, uh, falling on this day, uh, relegated to a commemoration. Uh, but as we've spoken about the readings uh, in yesterday's um, little uh, talk, uh, we will speak today about um, uh, St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. Also, uh, this is a religious name. He was born Francesco Possenti. Uh, we'll also hear um, about some of the other uh, miscellaneous saints of uh, the past few days. Uh, so starting there, um, we have St. Irene from the year 420. And this is interesting in that she was a pagan uh, girl, about 14 years of age, and she witnessed a mob abusing uh, St. Porphyrius for his faith. I don't know which Porphyrius that is. There's like 10 of them. But the violence um, upset her, and she came to his rescue, and she caused um, enough, it says, enough trouble that the pagans left him alone. And so when he recovered, he brought her to the faith, and she died of natural causes uh, later in life. So a great example of, um, you would say that the natural um, instinct that God has placed in man, uh, that, that that natural goodness that is brought to its fruition and completion by, uh, by Catholicism. Another one is Blessed uh, Martino Martini. He is a, was a convert to the faith, and then he joined the Franciscans. And though he never made a solemn profession or even actually became a friar, uh, but he stayed there at the monastery and did the most menial work in, in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, going barefoot, living off of bread and water, spending all of his free time in prayer, which uh, it got him into trouble, you could say. On one day, he uh, was working as cook, and he got so taken up in prayer, he forgot to cook breakfast. So he was admonished, and later the same day, he got lost in prayer again, and he was neglecting to cook the next meal. Um, so now this would be, this would be evidence of ecstasy, right? The saints talk about ecstasy. They're not aware of anything around them. So this is something that's, you know, it's not really his fault. It was just, he's, he's spending this time in prayer. So he's supposed to be cooking lunch and one of the friars is suspicious. So he came to check on him and sure enough, uh, he found, uh, blessed Martino not there, but instead angels were in the kitchen doing the cooking for him. So that was uh, quite something indeed. I wonder what that meal would have tasted like. Uh, we also, let's see, have, um, and those, those actually, all those saints I mentioned are from yesterday, the 26th. Um, for today, the 27th, um, there was, again, a number of Polish and German martyrs from the 1940s, some of the English martyrs from the 1500s, uh, the, um, uh, the persecutions of the Anglican Church there. Um, and and as, as you know, we have, we have those kind of groups of martyrs, the Mexican martyrs, um, you know, the early martyrs of early Rome, um, you have the Japanese martyrs, the African martyrs, um, all, all, and, and just so many of them, right? There, there, there'd be multiple, multiple every single day of the year are going to be multiples of these martyrs. So let's not forget them. Um, but now on to Francesco Possenti, uh, St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. Um, he was canonized in 1920 by Benedict XV, um, and he was born in 1838 in Assisi, Italy the 11th of 13 children. So um, as a child, he had a, a reputation for a great charity, great piety, but also known for being rather vain. He struggled with bouts of anger also. Uh, he was a very sociable young man. He earned for himself uh, the nickname The Dancer. So apparently he was popular with the ladies. Um, but around the age of 13, he had become very ill and promised to enter religious life if he recovered. And he did recover, but went right back to his usual way of living and completely neglected, forgot about his vow. Two years later, uh, he became very ill again and made the same promise again. So now he's 15, uh, but this time he actually followed through. So he, um, uh, he applied to the Jesuits, and sure enough, several months later, nothing happened. They just never responded. So he wondered what to do for some years. He, he, he tried to fulfill his vow. He applied. And then and nothing happened. It was just zero. So, um, you know, and this is, this is, I guess you'd say, I don't know, evidence of how God works sometimes. Um, he was, so he's kind of wondering, and he's taking part in a Marian procession, and an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary passes by, and he feels an interior voice asking him, why are you still in the world? 
And this made such an impression on him that he finally resolved to act. So he joins the Passionists instead. He uh, forgets about the Jesuits, joined the Passionists. And this, the Passionists, were founded uh, by St. Paul of the Cross in 1725. And um, his father and other relatives tried to dissuade him, but he'd made up his mind. And so he entered the Passionists at 18 and immediately showed himself to be an excellent student, an excellent example of piety. Uh, he wrote for himself a series of 41 resolutions, which are very much like what we read about in the lives of the saints. Uh, among them, he resolved to follow the rule perfectly, never to neglect any of his prayers, to fulfill his ordinary duties exactly, not to speak without necessity, never to defend himself when blamed or corrected, to see Christ in everyone, and many others. And these rules he kept nearly perfectly almost from when he first entered. Uh, so this is a great example of perseverance. Um, and many people, when they, they join the religious life, when they first begin, they have a great zeal and a, a fervor and a piety. And, uh, but it's, it's, very, it's very quickly lost, right? Especially if, if, if people continue for some time in the religious life. It's very, very hard to talk about recapturing that initial zeal. So St. Gabriel um, uh, did a, a very good job of, of maintaining that. Um, although he didn't have too long to practice for, uh, for he died only a few years after entering the order. Uh, but before he could be ordained a priest, he fell ill with tuberculosis and ended up dying a slow and painful death. Um, in fact, this was actually what he had prayed for. Um, he wanted a long death so that he could prepare himself for it. In fact, the story is told on his deathbed how he was so weak, he was barely able to move. Uh, but then right before he died, he suddenly sat up, had a radiant smile on his face, and opened his arms as if to greet some invisible person. And those uh, persons present are convinced he had a, blessed, a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, that would be in uh, 1862 is when um, he departed this world. So not, not too much from the life of, of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, um, although there is a famous instance, a uh, story told of him during an episode of political trouble in the 1860s. Um, and this is that um, a story of how um, in the monastery where St. Gabriel was staying, uh, some soldiers entered and began to pillage the town. And the other monks hid, and the abbot advi advised them to, to, to flee for their lives, but St. Gabriel did the opposite. He ran out and he confronted the soldiers. And, um, and so this, this, that, is, that very well may be true. But in fact, the, the author of this story admits to having embellished some details to make for a better story. So, uh, so it is, I mean, that the town was in trouble, that there were soldiers, uh, that all um, is most likely true. Even that St. Gabriel displayed um, courage or confronted them very well may be true. Uh, but... So the, the story goes that as the soldiers were, he was in this interchange with the soldiers, he grabs one of their pistols and points it at them. And an, another soldier came forward, and St. Gabriel grabbed his pistol as well. Now he's got two. And more soldiers gathered around, and St. Gabriel's outnumbered. And it's, not, it's a kind of this, this standoff. And just then a lizard runs across the street, and St. Gabriel takes aim and fires a direct shot and uh, uh, nails him. So the soldiers are impressed with his marksmanship and leave and the town hails St. Gabriel as a hero. Uh, this is one of those stories that um, uh, we have to note as being an embellishment, right? Like I said, the author himself says that is not a true story. Uh, kind of the idea of, a, but, but it should have been. Uh, now this, this is this, we should note that um, this would be a case where people would say, well, see, so we can't trust the other stories in the lives of the saints. However, uh, just as I've just said that this story is, is nice, but it's not true, um, because the author says it's not true, the author of the story itself, uh, there are cases in the past, like um, with the golden legend in the lives of the saints, uh, the authors who are recounting various miracles will say, here is something people say about this saint, but that is not true. Uh, like, that's been something that's been the case throughout history. It's not as if everything that's been said ever has been accepted. Uh, authors, even in the Middle Ages, even in the early church, would, were careful to distinguish uh, truth from uh, uh, fiction. And so the same thing here. So no different. Uh, we just have to, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it makes for a great story. That's probably why the author wrote it. But um, it ought to be something that is not believed as, you know, being exactly true. Uh, St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows displayed heroism, uh, was, um, you know, courageous in the face of trouble. But this story, mm, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, something to learn from St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows is the virtue of meekness, which restrains anger. Uh, everybody has a natural disposition, a natural temperament, 
whether it's to, to be reserved or to outgoing, right, introvert, extrovert, or to be more on the principal side of things or to be more on the practical side of things, more personable. And it's hard to overcome that. It's hard to, to switch to the opposite side. Um, so St. Gabriel was not by nature a meek and a humble and an introverted person. He was likable. He was sociable. He was a dancer. Uh, they said he was vain. He was prone to fits of anger. But he overcame all these by display and displayed the opposite virtues. He learned to control everything, uh, not to repress it, Repression is an unhealthy denial of feelings, uh, but to control it. We admit we have the feelings, admit that they're not good, they're out of control. We work on them, and we bring them into subjection. Uh, this he did, and he became meek and humble. And uh, this is a great point to make. Meekness is not weakness, but the world sees it that way. Because the only reason people in the world appear to be meek and humble is that they are too timid to say or to do anything. They just don't have passion. They don't have the ability to stand up for themselves. It's not a virtue in that case, it is a weakness. A person who has passion but who controls it is very rare. Um, so when that person comes along, the world is surprised. They mistake a meek person for being a timid person, and they dismiss it as being cowardly and weak. When the time for action comes, boom, that meek person surprises everyone. This is why the meek shall inherit the earth. They appear weak, but in fact, they are the most powerful. And so that is a great example of St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. And that's why, you know, he was able to go out and confront those soldiers when the time came. He was meek and humble, obeyed the rule, obeyed the order, looked like everybody else. When the time came, uh, that's when people saw, okay, this is a man who has mastered his passions. So let's um, think about, um, you know, this time, this, this uh, day and age, these things going on. Uh, we want something to happen, right? We want we want to see something happen, or we ourselves maybe want to do something, and we feel um, unable or trapped, or you know, if I just uh, you know have a, some peace and quiet, if I could be spend some time in prayer, if I didn't have all these kids, or if I was this or that or whatever, um, you know, we need to be humble and meek, uh, like Saint Gabriel Pacenti. Um We can think of ourselves almost like um, pieces on a chessboard, and you know that little pawn. Uh, you know, or that rook or whatever may, might just sit there for the entire game and just be there. And then in the last two moves of the game, that piece is the one that, that is used to up make a checkmate. And that could very well be God's, how God operates. Is it, we, we, you know, we see all this stuff going on, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And at the 11th hour, at the last minute, when nobody saw it coming, boom, you know, you're the one that gets used uh, to change everything. Um, so we never know, right? And it might be something small. It might be for, the, for, that, um, for that town, right? For that monastery, for your family, uh, for the world. I mean, who knows? Who knows who God's chess pieces are? Um, uh, but that's what we have to keep in mind, right? And that's what, that's what meekness enables us to be. Meekness prevents us from rushing out and doing something foolish. Uh, meekness prevents us, or I would say enables us, to feel the hand of God on us, to move us where he wills, to be exactly in the right position uh, where we're needed the most. So perhaps that's some lesson we could learn uh, from St. Gabriel Pacenti, mastering our passions, uh, mastering, um, you know, whatever temperament is. You know, he had that outgoing temperament. He mastered it and, and became, um, you know, more reserved. But that, that strength, that natural strength was there when it needed to be. So likewise, right, if um, we, we're naturally um, introverted, you know, learn to be outgoing, learn to be more active, more, more proactive. Um, and then what, you know, that, that thing that you're the best at, it'll be there when God needs it to be. Uh, so I'll just keep that in mind. Keep up our, our prayers, our penances, our sacrifices, and especially our spirit of peace, peace, humility, meekness, um, uh, constancy, uh, that those are going to be the most important, um, uh, qualities, right? Uh, what do they say that, that adage, uh, the millstone of God might grind slow, but it always grinds exceedingly fine. Uh, so we will be victorious in the end. We just have to be patient. So um, all holy saints um, and St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost.